My name is Gary Fowler, and I am the host today, and we are going to talk about how to build a unicorn. I have my incredible guest. Sanjay is an inventor, an investor, a pioneer in analytics and data science. He worked in places like uh, Radiant Systems at Microsoft as a teenager and a short stint at Trilogy. He founded Zenda, the market leader in embedded business intelligence, now used by 3M in his dorm room during his MBA. After Zenda to a million dollar run rate, Sanjay raised a Series A and formed a board and management team. He then started investing and advising. He's had seven companies and three successful exits. And I'd like to introduce my friend, Sanjay. So hi, Sanjay. How are you doing today? Hello there. Happy Wednesday. Glad to be here. Yeah, no, it's great to see you. Great to see you here again today. So we're going to talk about this. You know, you've been around building this unicorn for some time. So tell us a little bit about your background and how, what the, was the journey like? You know, my background has really been analytics and AI. I've always been, uh, I started in graphics and visualization and quickly found that visualization was a great way to explain data to people. Uh, so, you know, found my first company in my dorm room at Georgia State. And at the time, you know, um, AI was, you know, it really wasn't a thing yet. We were using very rudimentary systems to create reports for people instead of having engineers do it. And that's really just evolved into different forms of analytics and uh you know the the la you know my last company was Fitmatch where we were using lidar sensors on iPhones to actually work with Rihanna on her Fenty brand to take a a no contact scan of a torso to do fitting for apparel and you know a lot we're in very interesting times where AI is becoming you know human like but also superhuman in a lot of ways it can measure and analyze and predict in ways that you know the best human teams alive can't do so it's a really uh Really glad to be here. It's a it's a great month. We looks like we uh we figured out nuclear fusion, and we have superhuman AI that's accessible to uh over a million people uh, logged on to Chat GPT to try it out. That's uh that's kind of a record of how quickly a uh, new company's gotten to a million. We intend to break records ourselves. Well, so you know, let's talk about that Chat GPT. I know that you know you you've got a lot of things at Run Day that are quite interesting, but where's the market going? Yeah, so ChatGPT is based on the DaVinci 003 engine, uh, 3.5. And, you know, we use the same underlying technology for our platform. And what's happened is over the last couple of years, they have figured out how to take AI technologies that existed, you know, five years ago, but to actually scale them. And so there were technologies called LSTMs, which could take strings of text or like, you know, stock charts and read them and, and interpret them but the training for these would take hundreds of years so literally you'd have to turn the computer on wait multiple centuries and then you'd get back a result that that worked or perhaps worked and so the big innovation with these transformer models are that they attenuate in a certain way that you can do multiple centuries of, of data analysis in a matter of weeks or months and so like the GPT-3, it takes about, it's about 288 years of training that they do in, in three months time in parallel. So you're literally consuming a, a big chunk of human knowledge, so all of Wikipedia, popular works. And what they figured out is once you get into the multi-billion parameters, you're able to do, you know, kind of human-like or even superhuman level of conversational AI. So when I look at the future and where things are going, I don't think it's really metaverse, although that'll you know be a thing for gaming. I think every business will soon have a conversational AI that you can access 24-7 to ask questions, to do transactions, the book appointments, you know, middle of the night, in, in a time when there's labor shortages all around the world. So, you know, you have uh, Frontier Airlines literally shutting down their call centers and saying, okay, we're going to use WhatsApp and SMS for all customer support. They just, you know, it wasn't even a plan. It was an overnight, hey, this just doesn't work anymore. Phones are going the way of the fax machine. People don't want calls. They want to just text something and get a response. And so, you know, it's a combination of staffing the other end of that. But a lot of it's going to have to be handled through AI because there's literally not enough educated population um, that, that's young and willing to do those jobs today. So, we live, you know, there's nuclear fusion, there's superhuman AI that we now have uh, have access to. So there's a lot of uh, 
negativity in the world right now, but I think there's some amazing positive trends that are that have started emerging. Yeah, we need to have some of those beams of light. You know, we need to have uh, the energy. We're not going to have the fossil fuels. We got to figure out how to be able to heat our homes and and to be able to live better lives. And at the same time, you're right about it. You know, compassion and emotion and these new models that are coming out. So I got a question for you. You built a lot of successful teams. How did you go out and, you know, as you're building a unicorn, how do you build a successful team? I, you know, I've built, you know, several successful teams. I've also built a couple unsuccessful ones. So there's definitely a distinction. I think it's all about thinking about scale. You know, there's a tendency to sort of just kind of hire friends or some individual, you know, that's a superstar. The problem is as you try to scale, they, you know, whether it's ego or other reasons, it, it's it's hard to get them to work together. So, you know, I'd much rather have a, you know, uh, a, a good team that works together and complements each other than, you know, someone who's like a best in the world rock star. So the teams that have worked and, and most of mine have worked out, it's really mm-hmm. when we built a team and we really got them to work together in a way where, you know, especially globally is people were, you know, people were just, you know, excited on a Saturday afternoon without being asked to, to work on something, share ideas where it, it almost doesn't end, right? The, 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 not the people don't sleep, the team doesn't sleep, that you have continuous innovation. Even today we, we have, some new ideas that we came up with yesterday and you know we have our team in india working on it and then we're gonna have people in europe take it over and then we'll look at it tonight and it's like it, it just having a team that's 24 7 global and has perspectives you know you want some balance of gender you know you, you definitely don't want a all bro team as we see sometimes um you want a female perspective that, that you know in a fair way and you also want different you know major cultures represented so when you put that together um, you can look at the competitive landscape, identify weaknesses and strengths, know where you want to target and, and really just outperform um, in key areas that somebody, you know, may not consider as important. And so it's really about that, that team. And, you know, the funny thing is when you have a good team, it's, it starts scaling. You know, we've gone from, you know, really kind of three people to, to, to nine to 20 plus in, in under a year and expect that momentum to continue. No, you're right about it. You know, I wrote an article in Forbes about uh, intergenerationally, culturally diverse, decentralized teams, because the strength is in you get to see things differently, as our friend Steve Jobs said, right? You get to look at things differently and having those teams that have different viewpoints, different ways of understanding the market really widens it for you. I I agree 100 percent. So building a successful team, then, you know, at the same time, you know, advisors and investors are really important. So how do you know where to find the right investor? And how do you know who can be a right kind of advisor? And how important are advisors and the right kind of investor? For me, it's it's been a lot with conferences. So, I mean, the way you and I met as a, at a conference at, at Miami, at the AI conference, that's been the source of a lot of my uh, advisors that I found. I think it's also, it's, um, you know, people you just like make friends with and and you want to hang out with, you know, go biking or go to dinners and kind of have that personal level of trust. And then later an opportunity arises and you're like, you know what, they'd be a great advisor for this, uh, this new opportunity in this angle. So the advisors, uh, you know, they're, they're people that, you know, you'd, you'd love to, you'd love to hire full-time sometimes, um, but they have other opportunities and things, but you can leverage their knowledge base and their expertise, you know, without needing them to be at the company full-time. And so building a great team that's an augmented by a, a, a group of advisors that really can think through how to, you know, how to scale it. So I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs and companies that, you know, and I was guilty of this. My first couple of companies, you know, we had um, competitors that had multi-billion dollar exits and ours were a little bit more modest. Um, but I think we had this level of satisfaction with, which, with being locally successful. So in Atlanta, you know, we were in the, one of the top places to work. We were one of the fastest growing companies in Atlanta. And I think my mistake was that I, I didn't go global with it. I didn't think, okay, well, we may be top in Atlanta, but we're not, wh- where do we really rank globally? And I think to build a unicorn, you really have to think about every, you know, every major country, major language, culture. And if it's not going to scale to billions of people, you know, potentially indirectly, you got to think bigger. Yeah, no, you're right about it. You know, one of the things, you know, I call it the rule of threes. What I like to do is I like to have the right kind of advisors um, in 
So people like Rick Orloff, the former chief security officer at Apple, why? Because privacy and security always come up as an issue. doesn't matter mm -hmm. what kind of vertical comes up. The second thing is I look at a person that's got those contacts in Silicon Valley, somebody like a Bill Riker, somebody that's connected, Stanford MBA, Harvard undergraduate, VC, those kind of things, runs a $2 billion fund. Why? Because you need those warm connections. And the third thing that's interesting is finding somebody that has um, just had a successful exit, right? Because they got the visibility. And you find the power of those three. And if you look at it, you're going to cover all the uh, bases. So I'm right on with you in terms of the situation with. Now, the markets changed at the same time with the amount of data that we have to deal with out there. What are investors looking for today, Sanjay? What are they looking for in a company? Today, it's a company that's exciting enough to scale to the next generation. There's a lot of major demographic changes, and, and it's complicated. Um, I think we can oversimplify what's happening in the United States a little bit with, uh, you know, Gen X, you know, the millennials and Gen Z, and then the boomers still being a predominant part of the economy. But other countries have their own demographic curve. So it's like, what is next? Um, you look at the emergence of something like TikTok, right? That was... Um, you know, not something anyone expected. And it was, it was also innovated, you know, you know, from, you know, China and other foreign companies. And so I think investors are looking for something that has that really rapid level of adoption, where there used to be sort of a patience around something could take five or 10 years to hit critical mass. I think you want to you know, investors are looking for something that can hit the ground running and have a, a viable strategy to scale much quicker. Because one thing that's different is there's a lot of money on the sidelines. So this might sound bizarre um, to people not familiar with the investment landscape, but, you know, whether you're raising 500,000, 5 million or 50 million, it's about the same level of effort. And I would argue it's almost easier these days to raise 50 million than it is to raise, you know, 500K or 5 million because there's so, so many multi-trillion dollar, you know, um, kind of, uh, there's cash out in the sidelines, trillions of it. And it's just easier for them to make bigger bets. Now, that doesn't mean they want to bet on everything. Although if you look at, you know, FTX and some things that are happening there is there is sort of this has gone too far so they oh yeah, yeah. you know, here's a here's a you know here's a multi-billionaire bet we can make well sometimes they make the wrong one but at the same time there is a tendency that thinking big is is rewarded but also relevant right so investors don't you know this is odd when you're a scrappy entrepreneur sometimes investors don't want something that's going to be just big enough right? Like you really want to have that unicorn thinking. And, and that's something that's been a transition for me because I think I created some more modest companies and, you know, thinking back, it, they could have been bigger, right? So now I'm ready that if it's not going to affect billions of people, I that it's not, you know, I'm not going to obsess my life and every waking moment on it because it really, look at Runday. I mean, my, you know, time is our most valuable asset. And my biggest personal challenge, you know, we, I've multiple homes and different companies and, you know, and going back to traveling and just coordinating with all the people that are important to me, both, both socially and professionally is hard. And, you know, I don't have a life that warrants a full-time personal assistant. And if I did, they, you know, they wouldn't get any sleep. So I really built run day for myself in a lot of ways. And, you know, we have almost a selfish obsession with perfection with it, where it really is gradually becoming this, this super intelligent assistant that knows you, cares about you, and really want, cares about your goals in a way where it, you know, we're, we're, we're focused on more of the professional stuff and we're adding the social characteristics gradually, but it's really something that we think, you know, the, the future is not the metaverse, the future is going to be every business has you know a, an ai you can talk to at any time and every person is accessible not because you can call them or text them but because there's a greater intelligence that understands everyone's availability and whether it's a, a dinner date or a board meeting or biking it can actually understand what you're talking about through not nlp but nlu neuro linguistic understanding and create that event without you putting a lot of effort into it or not having to have this great personal assistant. No, no, I hear you 100%. I mean, think about, we talked about the other night, 
you know, each one of us here, I mean, think about it. We got some smart people online right now, but each one of us has about 300,000 items in the personal cloud, the entire web. Remember our, our conversation is 257,000 websites in 1996. You have more information in your personal cloud, the entire web. The problem is that number is doubling every year. In five years, 10 million items. How many times for the audience in the last two weeks has somebody said, I sent you a message, did you get it? Well, where'd you send it? <laughs> I said it to Telegram or Signal or WhatsApp or Slack or your email. Uh, uh, when did you send it? Well, I sent it three days ago. Let me check. I can't find it. Will you send it again? We're going to see more and more of that. So these intelligence, hyper-intelligent assistants that have emotion and compassion, kind of like your grandmother that care about you, right? It's uh, only unconditional love. It's going to be really important. We're going to see that over the next couple of years, and it's going to come in droves, right? And what you've done with Run Day is just amazing. You know, having, uh, you know, seven startups, three exits, and here you are with Run Day moving forward. By the way, how in the world, you've done seven companies, what made you decide to go down through and do Run Day? How did you, did you just, are you addicted to doing startups or where does that come from? Well, I think a lot of it was the idea of Run Day actually is a couple of years older. We were thinking in terms of restaurants and finding ways to find the best place to meet with a group. And we had a lot in R&D, but the technology, you know, until transformer models became available, technology didn't exist to really make it work. And then um, really at my, my last startup, we were with the middle of Omicron. Um, normally, we'd all probably have been in at the store or near it in person, you know, putting, you know, building the store, building the technology, you know, doing all the software, the hardware. But because of Omicron, that wasn't possible. And so we just had around the clock meetings, constant Zoom calls. And I just, um, you know, I just realized I, I, I wanted to, you know, recre recreate run day for this new world where mm -hmm. we're doing so many calls like, like Zoom and, uh, you know, really focuses on the, because there's technologies out there that can kind of book one-on-ones well, but we're talking about, you know, enterprise teams, multiple vendors, multiple people on each team, you know, in different time zones and or sleep at different times. And I realized these transformer models were capable of understanding the nature of how, how the world works and how people want to connect and, and really being this, you know, this, this assistant that does it for you. And so, it, and then, you know, I think my life had always had this challenge and I tried, I think we tried over a hundred different uh, technologies that existed out there between chatbots and, you know, email, you know, email AIs. And there were, you know, and there were companies that spent tens of millions of dollars to try to develop this type of technology before, but it wasn't until I think Elon Musk catalyze this with a you know billion dollar investment into open ai and then microsoft followed that they had the compute capabilities to really pull this off and then so by by once i saw that and i saw what was possible uh i realized we could finally attack this problem and create a world where you know connecting is far more seamless i mean our, our, our technologies are supposed to connect us and they disconnect us in so many ways yeah, no, you're right about it. I mean, I know when, uh, you know, um, I go out with my daughter and I'll go out to lunch and she's a very successful um, influencer and she's on her phone all the time and I, I try to talk to her and she's on her phone and, you know, we get, we, you're right about it. We got to bring some humanity. So I got a question for you, you know, building all your uh, startups, what are the key characteristics of startup, successful startup entrepreneurs? I think that if to boil it down in one word, it's really commitments. You know, we hear the story in the media of the overnight success, but we don't hear about the, the you know, the decade a lot of times it took to get there. Um, you look at Angry Birds, right? It was this immediate overnight success as soon as the App Store came out. But Angry Birds was their 53rd game. So they had created 50 different games. No one knew at the time what a mobile game was supposed to be. So they created 50 games that didn't work until came up with Angry Birds and they just stayed committed to it. So I think we're, you know, we're in a time right now where, you know, it's one of the memes out there is like, you know, be rich instead of looking rich. So it's so easy to sort of like fake it these days. And you look at things like FTX as an extreme example of that, that people aren't willing to commit to the, I mean, not just the, the hours it takes every week, but the years it sometimes takes 
to get things to a sustainable level. And so, you know, I've met hundreds of entrepreneurs and, you know, the ones that succeeded had ups and downs. It wasn't that they just had a great idea. It was, it was a great idea and a combination of great execution and terrible execution that, that, but, but a commitment to stay driven on the goal and, and really get something to scale. No, I, I, I agree with you. And, you know, the one thing we talk about things like passion and optimism and visualization. And uh, I did a TED talk a few years ago and I talked about unleashing the human potential, but, you know, having that drive and visualize painting the pictures of where you want to go and believing in that dream and going out and doing it, going out and taking those proactive steps. I mean, I think it's like 98% of doing a startup is, you know, a lot of people talk about it, but they never do anything about it. Yeah, a lot yeah, of Einstein you know, said it was 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Um, but it's, but you know, these days it's, it's a long game. Um, I was, uh, we were at, an, I think it was for GSD actually, it was uh, one of the investors was talking about some stats about on average is taking about 11 years these days to exit while the average marriage is something like seven years. And so, you know, you're talking about that kind of, you know, decade plus commitment to creating something amazing. And I see a lot of people unable to commit for a few months. They, they like an idea, they get excited about it. And then the first sign of challenge, they, they just kind of give up and, and go back to their job or, or whatever they go back to. But um, and that, now that doesn't mean stay committed to the, the wrong idea. So the original idea with Run Day was, was to work with restaurants, kind of like Groupon does, to charge them to get people into the restaurant. Now, that wasn't the right idea. Um, you know, I think if you look at a lot of the big startups and, you know, unicorns today, their original idea was not what they're doing and, and, you know, neither was run day. So I think we, you know, as the world changed throughout the pandemic, we figured out a lot of things, or even at fit match, you know, we, we had sort of a different model of, uh, you know, reselling retail and, you know, it wasn't until the pandemic happened that we realized this no contact was this massive opportunity that you couldn't touch someone with a tape measure or get near them the way a tailor used to and that we needed a technological solution that worked even better and we we were able to create that based on the challenges in front of us so it's really when challenges arise instead of quitting really you know not staying committed to your original path but pivot staying committed to success and pivoting in the right direction then you know sometimes it takes a few pivots it's not necessarily just one so it's just it's just a long game. No, I, I agree with you. You know, we, um, with my company, Eva, that we exited in May, we went through three pivots. We were Google-like search for the personal cloud. Then we were assistant. Um, and uh, Google came into the picture with their task assistant. Then we did remote workforce management. But every time we pivoted, you know, we went down through it. We thought we had the right thing. Uh, people didn't remember their passwords. So when we went down through, they loved the idea. They understand the pain point, cross-platform search, search. They didn't remember the passwords. And they had things in there that they didn't want to, they didn't want to uh, look at, right? We scanned pictures and all that. And so we pivoted and we pivoted to the task assistant, right? We did the, you know, um, it was basically a single version, cross-platform version of some of the things you're doing. We go with multiple emails, say, listen, you're supposed to have a meeting. You might want to check it out. We went down, you know, we would go down through, you have this urgent email, they want to set up a meeting. Would you like to set up a meeting? And uh, then Google came out with something and we moved on to remote workforce management before the pandemic and it worked. So, you know, getting in there and believing in your dreams and moving forward and moving as fast as you can, you know, and, you know, for all the startups out there, listen, it's kind of like riding a dragon, right? And it's up and down. And the thing is, you know, it's never as bad as you think it is. And it's never as good as you think it is. It's somewhere in the middle. But one of the things you got to do is you got to focus on the positive. You got to believe in those dreams. You got to visualize where you want to go. You got to be thankful in a lot of ways. And if you go out there, the networking contacts and communication is really important. Go out and meet with people. You know, Silicon Valley, the mentality of Silicon Valley is right on. Because if you look at it, today, there's $290 billion worth of dry powder in the planet Earth. A lot of money is located right in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is a port to the rest of the world. 
That's not to say they don't have offices in other places. That doesn't mean they haven't started in other countries, but they do have offices there. So if you want to meet Bosch or Siemens, Walmart Ventures, Samsung, they're there. And so, you know, this is like fishing. I grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania. I remember as a kid, Sanjay, I went out, my friend, we had three ponds by the house. And I remember one time we ran out and I said to my friend, I said, let's have a little fishing contest. He said, let's do it. I said, I'll take the pond to the left. He took the pond to the right. Uh, went out at seven o'clock in the morning, 1130 in the morning, uh, we came back. I had 12 trout. He didn't have any. He said, what happened? I said, I said, they stocked the pond yesterday. And so I caught the fish and they use corn as a bait, right? They use cornmeal to feed the fish. And I just took a can of my mom's corn and put it on the hook. This is not rocket science. Go where the fish are. Same with the startups. Go where the investors are, right? You need those warm contacts. You know, we're an invest. I'm an investor too. And I know you are, right? Go out, warm contacts. If somebody brings a deal to you and they say, listen, Sanjay, take a look at it. This could be interesting for you going to look right? It's the same thing with partnerships and relationships. Go out there. And if you go to somebody who may take you years to get to normally, but if you got a relationship, you know, they'll pick up the phone and talk, use it. So for the startups, use your networking contacts, go out, believe in those dreams. Um, you know, so we've talked about uh, what are the characteristics of a successful, of successful startup entrepreneurs, Sanjay, but what are the keys to a successful company building? And what are some of the pitfalls? You know, there's a lot of literature and conversation around fundraising. And I think, you know, we have to be very careful and understand that fundraising is not success. Um, there's so much dry powder out there and, and interest rates have been low. We've just been in an economic environment where people have just, you know, been successful through fundraising, but have, have never really built a business. So I think a lot of things is like, you know, when does this business really start growing profits? You look at Amazon, right? They were unprofitable for a long time and people criticized Jeff and everything for that. But what they didn't recognize is Jeff had a button that at any time, if you wanted to turn off R&D and, and stop expanding the new areas new categories he could make a cash machine just spit out a lot of money almost overnight so it's not necessarily that you're profitable from an ebit or an accounting perspective but if you really wanted to how much cash could your business generate and so i think that to me is a much more relevant metric than how much you know how much fundraising you did so if we take out the 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 fact that there's been a lot of fundraising for companies that are never going to be profitable. I mean, even Michael Burry is talking about the, uh, the S&P 500 and there's an, an, a lot of companies, some of them are partners of ours that are have incredible technologies, but they're, they're not necessarily valued um, as highly. And the only reason they're valued so highly is because they're part of the S&P or part of an index. So there's very, very unprofitable companies that have raised a lot of money that, and, and they're good. I'm not saying they're bad teams or bad technology. Some of them are, very impressive team that I respect a lot, but just their financials indicate that they have to continue to raise money in order to survive. They don't have a magic button that they could become profitable and generate cash overnight the way Amazon has always had that. And so you got to look at that kind of success in terms of can you create enterprise value in, in a bad environment? Like in a bad environment, what are your options? Can you stop investing? Can you focus? Can you become really profitable and cash flow positive very quickly? So to me, that's always, and, and you know, you may go over like Amazon did, you may go a very long time till you do it. Um, but the ha always having that potential in your business, that is an aspect of success, I think is forgotten in the era of, of easy fundraising. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right on target. So what do you see over the next year? I mean, what do you, what's happening now? What do you see over the next year for these, you know, the companies are out there? What's the market going to look like? And, you know, what should they focus on? You know, just like if you look back to, you know, a couple of years, you know, the world today is almost unrecognizable. You know, if you didn't know what was going to happen, you would never expect, you know, rents are doubling and supply chains, you know, and, and different things, both, both positive and negative. I think in the, you know, we're, we're going to potentially have a rough, period ahead of us. And that's my opinion. You know, it, 
is more controlled by you know interest rates and other things. But what you're seeing is the potential. I mean, I think augmented, while it won't be the metaverse the way we talk about it today, you're going to see augmented reality becoming more an aspect of business um, as Apple and Microsoft release more and more of these headsets and, and you have a lot more competition to get get this technology right. Um, there's going to be a major energy revolution. Um, you know, I think some of the things that have happened geopolitically are almost forcing it. And so, you know, nuclear fusion, my theory would be just like with the vaccine, we used artificial intelligence to accelerate a decade process into a matter of months. Independent of what you think of the results, it was a, a, an incredible miracle that we were able to produce a vaccine that quickly. I think that is potentially something that can happen with nuclear fusion. So you might see a lot of excitement around a world where we can we can create stars and produce enormous amounts of energy um, and also, you know, much smaller fission devices that, are, that can fit inside of a truck that can be moved around if necessary. You're going to see a major energy re revolution. I mean, I, personally, me, I'm putting up solar panels and wind turbines just to power bikes and small devices. So you're going to see a movement toward electric bikes, you know, wind and solar to power them. Um, fusion, there's going to be just massive, you know, just wholesale transition of the economy, whether that, you know, and that instead of taking 20 years, I think that will happen much faster than we think, uh, you know, at, as people, you know, as we adopt AI. The other parts of it is, you know, every business you describe it as a grandmother, but, you know, to me, it's it's uh, just kind of a 24-7 a personal assistant that every business has that's doing both internal and external communication. Mm -hmm. So if it's four in the morning, I want to buy, you know, insurance, I'm going to just WhatsApp an insurance company, have a conversation with that artificial intelligence, get a quote, you know, perhaps even sign for it and pay for it. Um, but that is not going to require an appointment with or a phone call to a human being. The phone will go to the way of the fax. Someone like me, if I have to fax you to do business with you, I'm going to look for someone else. I'm just not willing to do that uh, unless there's just no choice whatsoever. I'm just not going to do business with a fax oriented company, phone calls will go the same way. You know, I have a younger girlfriend and uh, we have a subscription to a uh, massage envy and, you know, she loves going to get a couple's massage. Um, but it's very hard to find out when they have availability as she does not want to call them. It's not worth getting a massage to, to have to call them and deal with somebody on the phone. So you're seeing this more in terms of the younger generation, but I'm, I'm hearing this from, uh, from older people as well now that, Everyone's just tired of the phone calls to get things done. And if you can just send a message. So you're seeing, you know, 99% of the bots out there right now, they're getting deployed, but they don't, they can't answer two plus two. So I think the investments we're already seeing into sort of bots that were designed for a world where you had live chat and you had plenty of staff just sitting there waiting to, to chat with somebody, that's going to go away. And you're going to see an artificial intelligence on the other side of that, that books an appointment with the very best human beings that they have, not just anyone who's awake and around. So energy transition um, and, and a rapid transition toward a conversational intelligence as, as a big driver, even Mark Zuckerberg, you know, was, um, you know, talking to Wall Street a couple of weeks ago about, you know, WhatsApp business is going to be a major driver of revenue for them. Um, you know, the metaverse, the way he sees it, it's still at least a decade away. Uh, my opinion, it's it's probably much further away. But um, he's absolutely right that WhatsApp, it's used by over 2 billion people, but 195 million people use it to con talk to businesses. It's massive in India and many parts of the world. And it's going to be the, the it, it's, you know, it's, it's more efficient than SMS. Uh, I see WhatsApp as a major channel for businesses to, to be more competitive, um, deal with these labor shortages that are, you know, they're projected to end in the 2040s. Um, so we look at them, it's not, we're going to raise interest rates and suddenly there's going to be a bunch of labor available. Um, if you look at immigration, demographics, birth rates, um, we're, it's going to be two decades before you have what we consider a more normal population curve. So there's going to be labor shortages for a very long time and AI will solve that problem. No, you know, I'm with you. And, you know, the other thing is, you know, our population of planets, 8.1 billion going to 13 billion. 
By 2050, we have to double the food supply to feed everybody. So technologies that increase crop yield, the internet of things from the, from the farm to the table, gonna be really important. I mean, for God's sakes, we couldn't even get a roll of toilet paper during, um, we, during the um, COVID, right? We had a problem with toilet paper. Now, how can it be we have quantum computers and we couldn't figure out where, to where the toilet paper is? So technologies that give us transparency into the supply chain, we continue to see problems there. Global warming needs to be addressed. Average temperatures around the world could be up four and a half to seven degrees Fahrenheit by the end of this century. I mean, we got to learn how to work together. We got 8.1 billion people going to estimated 13 billion by the end of the century. 1.4 billion in Africa. Estimated Africa would be as big as uh, China and India combined by the end of the century. Whether that's true or not, but the largest population in the world under 30s in Africa today in 54 countries. So we got to figure out how to work together. I love what you're doing at Run Day. It's incredible. You're doing a great job. For all of you out there, these opportunities, artificial intelligence, um, NLP, deep learning, machine learning, all these technologies that take the massive amounts of data, the infobesity around us and make sense of our, for our world and can help us make decisions are gonna come happen more and more. So if you're out there investing in those kind of companies, if you're out there creating those kind of companies, now's the time, the day has come. Think about our world in terms of the data. Sanjay, I wanna thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. And I wanna thank, thank for having each, me. each and every one of the participants for joining us today. My name is Gary Fowler, and I am the CEO, President, and Founder of GSD, Get You Done Venture Studios, Premier AI and Quantum Venture Studio, located in Silicon Valley. Stay tuned. We'll be back in another two weeks. It's another exciting edition. Thanks again, and thank you for joining How to Build a Unicorn. Thanks, Sanjay. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Mm -hmm.